Let us conclude this course again taking a look beyond physics, that is, dwelling a bit more into the metaphysical ruminations we did also as an appendix to the lectures on quantum physics. I would like to complete this journey again taking the standpoint of Sri Aurobindo, because I believe it is worthwhile to look at how the perspective from a higher state of consciousness may furnish us a deeper understanding of the metaphysical ontology of concepts and physical categories we are using as randomness, chance, energy, force, space, time, or if you prefer, space-time. So let us begin with randomness and chance. We tried to furnish already a deeper perspective of notions like randomness and, and chance in physical sciences pointing out how, at a closer scrutiny, these concepts, while useful for practical applications and in limited, limited domains, are, however, not only ill-defined when we try to associate it a deeper philosophical meaning, but the, the, that these concepts are all too often backed by unwarranted, hidden and unaware assumptions such as that they might tell us about a lack of purpose, final causes and meaning of the physical universe and its workings. We showed that a process that is governed by purely random laws can, cannot tell us if the same process is determined or not by a conscious will and a purposeful action. Even the random outcome of tostasis is in no way a proof for a lack of teleological action. A cryptic message can be considered random, and yet it contains meaning if you have the key to decode it, and that has been created, created by a conscious mind with a conscious will. Randomness is just a word that stands as a euphemism for ignorance and our unconsciousness about the chain of the true causes and effects and the, 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 the origin of the messenger, so to speak. To human mind, a process might result as perfectly random, a perfectly random set of events according to all the scientific criteria, definitions and tests of randomness, and yet be driven by a conscious will with a final aim. In fact, we saw how this becomes an almost obvious and logical fact once physical processes are more closely inspected and we allow us to look at things without these hidden assumptions we usually work with. We don't need to resort to higher states of consciousness to realize, to realize this. Uh, but we must become aware of our ideological preconceptions and learn to set them aside. However, if we are still not able to ascend higher states of consciousness, the question whether the material universe might be governed nevertheless by a hidden determining will of a cosmic mind or consciousness or creator will remain forever a matter of personal and subjective choice. On one side, everything seems to be to, to, de to depend from a self-organizing dynamic chance, an unaccountable freak and fantasy of the cosmic phenomenon we call nature. To mind, everything appears an inconscient force that acts and creates at random, and nevertheless, mind alone can never argue, reflect and finally establish with certainty that this is indeed the final truth and the final world. Ultimately, the limited individualized human mind can only speculate, not prove conclusively. It can only debate endlessly on the issue because there is something in its nature which lacks inherently a power of comprehension whereby it will never be able to catch and put forward a final and ultimate formula, formula that 
will be generally accepted and will show us what the truth is. Against this, the preferred escapade of scientific Darwinism is the watchmaker analogy that states how by the laws of natural selection, adaptation, the survival of the fittest, mixed by chance events dictated by the environment and other external constraints or biochemical and genetical factors, then by putting all these things together, everything can be explained away and any necessary uh, necessity and necessary uh, idea of a, of, a, of a divine intervention uh, is no longer a necessity in, in, as such. It is simply, a, as scientists used to say, a non-necessary hypothesis. But also this remains a mere speculation, since it's true that these natural laws exist and play a role in forming and molding the species at a microevolutionary level. But biology is, in any case, far from proving that this alone is a sufficient basis to explain all the existence of complex and conscious organisms. The laws of evolution are best documented for the microbiological domain, but we are far from having an empirically proven complete theory of evolution for the macrophysical organisms with all their psychological and so sociological uh, complexity. After all, with the idea of the evolutionary advantage, if we think about it, one can explain everything and the contrary of everything. Moreover, unanswered remains the question why our universe seems to have implanted in itself from the outset just the right laws of which randomness can profit from so successfully. Because chance alone, without the predetermined background of the physical laws as they are and the biological principles and the guiding laws of Darwinian evolution would only lead to an even worse and even more chaotic and uh, chaotic universe in an infinite increase of entropy globally and locally. These laws and principles our universe abides to are far from being self-evident and obvious. Where do these laws and principles come from? Science simply as curtains it, uh, sees that they exist and opposes it from the outset, since it observes them to be already given and without further reflection and questioning, and then believes the clockwork is, will do, that is doing the rest and will do everything that is necessary. But rising only a little bit above the human mind, one sees that not only this is an unaware assumption, but realizes also the cosmos, aim and hidden final causes as an obvious state of affairs. As pointed uh, out also Shoyobindo, uh, and as he summed it up as follows. The truth consciousness is everywhere present in the universe as an ordering, ordering self-knowledge by which the one manifests the harmonies of its infinite potential multiplicity. Without this ordering self-knowledge, the manifestation would be merely a shifting chaos precisely because the, potentiali the potentiality is infinite, which by itself might lead only to a play of of uncontrolled, unbounded, unbounded chance. If there were only infinite potentiality without any law of guiding truths and harmonious self-vision, without any predetermining, predetermining idea in the very seed of things cast out from evolution, for evolution, the world could be nothing but a teeming, amorphous, confused uncertainty. Therefore, the question if a final cause, a purpose, 
and an aim in the creation and evolution of the cosmos exists or even not, is not a question that can be solved at the rational scientific level. No more, no less than the variability and intensity and color of a single dot or pixel on a screen can tell us about the screenplay. It is only by going beyond this limited vision comprehending the whole dynamical play of forces and events that we can realize the meaning and more profound significance of the single phenomenon and then literally connect the dots. According to Sheobindo, all action, all mental, vital, physical activities in the world are the operation of a universal energy, a consciousness force, which is the power of the cosmic spirit working out the cosmic and individual truths of things. But since this creative consciousness assumes in matter a mask of inconscience and puts on the surface appearances of a blind universal force executing a plan or organization of things without seeming to know what it is doing, the first result is kin to this appearance it is the phenomenon of an inconscient physical individualization, a creation not of beings but of objects. That's the difference between beings and objects. Objects are at bottom also beings, but which are moved uh, by an inconscient force. But at bottom everything is consciousness. The principle of free variation of possibilities natural to an infinite consciousness would be the explanation of the, uh, the aspect of inconscient chance of which we are aware in the workings of nature, inconscient only in appearance, and so appearing because of the complete involution in matter, because of the veil with which the secret consciousness has disguised its presence. So, according to Shorabindo, the supramental vision reveals us the root cause of the dilemma that plagues one, on one side the materialist's denial that sees randomness as a characteristic sign of lack of purpose, but can't go beyond an ideological statement of facts. And on the other side, the, the spiritualist that would like to recognize in the workings of nature a final cause, but does not know unless someone goes beyond the mental sense-mind perceptions of the physical world. There is indeed a consciousness force at the base of every universal event, but since it is involved and self-forgetful of itself in matter, it inevitably must appear as random and repeated, a rep repetitive blind action. We might say that randomness and chance are the result of a conscious will, which manifests itself to mind as a disordered and apparently incoherent amalgam of play of forces and, apparent, up, up, and uh, apparently unconnected results. And that takes this as a proof for the absence of will itself. Or to put it again in, in another perspective, randomness and chance appear because of an evolutionary process of a divine consciousness which plunged itself into the mechanical and inconscient matter and which can find itself back only through a process of trial and error. It is about a reality which is manifesting and working itself out by this evolutionary process but which has lost its original supreme consciousness getting into matter. This explains why so much of this universe appears to us being a random play of forces and yet with something in it that nevertheless allowed for the emergence of consciousness. How do we know that? We 
never will by searching with a rational analytical approach. We must rise to higher states of consciousness where the workings of a hidden will then becomes a self-evident and self-explanatory given fact that one sees as something that becomes totally obvious. Now that we have clarified the role of chance and randomness seen from a higher consciousness perspective, let us proceed further with the same approach applied to the fundamental categories of physics and that we posited as being force, energy, space and time, or space-time. Let us begin with the first two. In fact, we saw how the entire universe can, at least in principle, be described by modern physics in terms of these fundamental entities. Force and energy have a precise definition in physics, such as the change in time of momentum of a body, the momentum of a body, and the capacity of a body to perform work respectively. But definitions, as rigorous they might be, do usually not tell us much about the essence and the true nature of these conceptual objects we are talking about. The ontology remains obscure. Physics, in fact, is about processes, not about the essence and the ultimate reality of these processes. Physicists study the how and the why of these fundamental forces and energies, but don't care about what these forces and energies are really at bottom. And it can't be otherwise. If we accept that we are looking at things from a limited cons consciousness, then of course it can't be otherwise. So for example, take electricity or gravity. We can describe quite well the phenomenon, once given the boundary conditions. We can also predict how these phenomena act dy dynamically in space and time. We can see how they rest on some principles, such, for example, the equivalence principle of general relativity, which tells us that we, if we recreate, we can, we are, we recreate, we can recreate zero gravity conditions in a falling airplane. That's a nice picture here of Hawking in the um, airplane where zero gravity uh, exists for a few dozens of seconds, I guess. But all these laws and principles don't tell us what electricity and what gravity is, after all. If, so to speak, we become aware of our unawareness, it is not so difficult to realize why a strictly, a strictly rational and material science struggles so much to find the essence of things. If we accept that every process in our universe might be an event that occurs in a fundamental, indivisible reality that is an ever changeless and ever changing infinite Brahman, we might be able to look further, at least with an inner intuitive perception of reality. Following Sri Aurobindo, in fact, the source of space and time is an immovable and immutable that nevertheless creates the illusion of motion and mutability something which at the human mind level is only a wordplay or a contradiction in itself, if you wish. But this is because of our sensory perception, uh, which is based on a fragmenting and dividing sense mind. What our sense mind realizes is a mutable relation of forms and intershocks of forces of external shocks and struggles instead of viewing all things in a mul multiple unity as supermind does. But again, this might be not so distant and alien if we look at how modern physics indeed represents forces and energies. We saw that physics uh, 
sees and posits and has discovered only four fundamental forces the electromagnetic force gravity and the two and the two nucle nuclear forces their workings can loosely speaking be translated into an action of change as also that of permanence stability the immutability of material structures force is action that produces change in time or on the other side keeps aggregates like particles atoms and molecules tied together to give form to things while energy is a measure of the potentiality to bring about this change from the highest standpoint change mediated by energies and forces and its forms is a manifestation of one of the infinite potentialities of this supreme consciousness and will here we see Shobino speaks of all phenomenal existence resolves itself into force into a movement of energy that assumes more or less material more or less gross or subtle forms for self presentation to its own experience so this is a brahman who presents itself to itself by this conscious will that we call physically see and realize with our sense mind as force physical forces force is thus inherent in existence and it is the nature of force to have this double or alternative potentiality of rest and movement that is to say of self concentration in force and self diffusion in force the energy that creates the world can be nothing else than a will and will is only consciousness applying itself to a work and a result the first terms of life are division a force driven subconscious will a force driven subconscious will apparent not as will but as dumb urge of physical energy and the impotence of an inert subjection to the mechanical forces that govern the, in the interchange between the form and its environment the power of the self has the appearance of a force and then he says supermind is present even though concealed in every form and force of the universe again the processes in our cosmos are self presentations of it i t capital letters huh? in itself it in itself and with what we would represent in conventional physical terms attractive and repulsive forces like the electric forces or attractive forces as gravity as self concentrations and self diffusions in force all is essentially response to vibra vibratory contacts between force and force so what is force and energy in sri aurobindo's vision physical force arise, arises as a self concentration of something into itself but since since force is thus inherent in existence and it is the nature of force to have this double or alternative potentiality of rest and movement that is to say of self concentration in force and self diffusion in force the question of how but since force is thus inherent in existence and it is the nature of force to have this double or alternative potentiality of rest and movement that is to say as he also said previously of self concentration in force and self diffusion in force the question of the how of the movement its possibility initiating impulsion or impelling cause does not arise at bottom we must posit consciousness con consciousness as the origin of all things the nature of physical forces is the, is the taking shape and form of consciousness in space and time 
So he continues, and however, the phenom phenomenon of consciousness may be explained whether nature be an inert impulse or a conscious principle, it is certainly force. The principle of things is a formative movement of energies. All forms are born of meeting a mutual, mutual ab adaptation between unshaped forces. All sensation and action is a response of something in a form of force to the contact of other forms of forces. force. This is the world as we experience it, and from this experience we must always start. Also, physics recognizes that matter is, after all, only the appearance of a force onto another force as a formative movement of energies, in fact. This, we will see this in the quantum field theory, this becomes quite clear. In fact, he says here, matter is the presentation of force, which is most easily intelligible to our intelligence, molded as it is by contacts in matter, to which a mind involved in material brain gives the response. The, the elementary state of material force is, in the view of the old Indian physicist, a condition of pure material material extension in space of which the pe peculiar property is vibration typified typified to us by the phenomenon of sound but vibration in this state of ether is not sufficient to create forms there must first be some obstruction in the flow of the force ocean some contraction and expansion some interplay of vibrations, some impinging of force upon force, so as to create a beginning of fixed relations and mutual effects. And mutual effects. Material force, modifying its first ethereal status, assumes a second called in the old language the aerial of which the special property is contact between force and force. Contact that is the, the basis of all material rela relations. Still, we have not as yet real forms, but only varying forces. A sustaining principle is needed. This is provided by a third self-modification of the primitive force, of which the principle of light, electricity, fire and heat is for us the characteristic manifestation. Even then, we can have forms of forces preserving their own character and peculiar action, but not stable forms of matter. A force state characterized by diffusion and first medium of permanent attractions and repulsions, termed picturesly water or the liquid state, and the fifth of cohesion, termed earth or the solid state, completes complete the necessary elements. Note how Sri Aurobindo realizes that we must not take these categories as water, earth, wind and fire literally, uh, uh, but only as metaphors, which however are supposed to suggest intuitively something about the, mm, the qualities these forces assume at different levels of existence. Uh, the above description is a bit reminiscent of quantum field theory, uh, where everything is all about vibrating force fields in space-time coordinates systems, which give rise to the material, mat materiality of things by their mutual contact in form of attraction or repulsion. There we have a theory where at every point in space and at any given time, a vib vibrating field that is a so-called harmonic oscillator is associated. In quantum field theory, this is described by a probability field that tells us how much probability there is that in a given location in space and at a given time a particle will be found or interact 
or more precisely, an interaction between a force field with another force field will occur. As with the case of the atomic orbital theory, we know that atoms are not hard objects but must be described more appropriately by, so to speak, soft probability clouds. Sri Aurobindo's representation is very in line with modern quantum field theory in the sense that matter is no longer seen as made of single chunks we like to identify as particles, but it describes it all as vibrating fields localized in space and time. What ultimately oscillates is a probability field with some extension. That is, the probability that an event will take place at that point in space and at that time, and which becomes the origin of a, what Scherbindo calls a formative movement, which only when it interacts with another harmonic oscillator defines the fixed relations. But physicists do not know what these quantum fields are. They just speak of the quantum of the field of an electron, a proton, or whatever kind of particle. And they don't know what this is other than an abstract mathematical function defined in space and time that tells us about the probability to observe the force in action. But it tells us nothing about the nature of this force itself. However, modern physics is increasingly increasingly questioning um, deeper the fundamental reality of force, energy, space and time. For example, some physicists believe that the universe is information theoretic. That is, everything can be described by information. If we try to investigate with mind what appears to our sense mind, we see how finally everything dissolves into something immaterial and that cannot be defined further than just information. Or as John Archibald Wheeler, a famous physicist, used to say uh, is that everything emerges from bits of information and we are ourselves somehow a complex aggregate of these information bits who are observing the very same universe made again of bits. Pictorially, he tried to simplify this idea by drawing an eye which is observing its own self-extension, like you can see here. This was um, exemplified and this was summarized by Wheeler also with his famous it from bit statement, and namely that it from bit symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, at a very deep bottom in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation that which we call reality arises in the last analysis from the posing of yes-no questions and the registering of equipment evoked responses in short, that all things physical are information theoretic in, ori in origin, and that this is a participatory universe. So it looks like physics suspects that this it is a bit in disguise, so to speak, that hides behind a veil from its own view by a material process. In this view, the very stuff of the universe is information. But, fine, well, but after all, what is information? What is the bit then? Again, science defines information rigorously, but cannot tell us nothing about what at all information is, after all, at bottom. Sri Bindo goes a similar way, but goes deeper where science cannot go, and tells us that the cosmic force, masked as a material energy, hides from our view by its insistent material materiality of process the occult fact, fact that the 
that the working of the inconscient is really the expression of a vast universal life, a veiled universal mind, a hooded gnosis, and without these origins of itself it could n have no power of action, nor no organizing coherence. What he is therefore saying to the modern scientists, uh, he wrote that uh, in, 19, in the 1920s, about 100 years ago, but this is still very actual, and also because occult truths don't change in time, I would say, is that the universe has wrapped itself into different layers. A, who, a who that knows us, a universal mind, not to mistake with a human mind, a universal life, and again, not to mistake with just only the terrestrial life, and that only at a very superficial level, at the superficial crust on which our human mind is focused on, appears as a cosmic force and material energy. So let us proceed now with Sriobindo's supramental vision and see how what we call space and time may again have some parallels in the light of modern physics. We discussed briefly how actually theoretical physics is searching for a theory that unites into a single and unique description quantum mechanics and general relativity. It is now more than half a century that generations of physicists did try hard to find for such a theory, but so far in vain. There is, however, a broad consensus that one of the reasons of this failure is that physics always gave it for granted that space and time, or more generally space-time as described in general relativity, is fundamental and for our normal sense-mind human understanding it is something which presents itself as something self-evident, given as an obvious reality which only philosophers eventually felt worth further investigation. But physics, physicists usually take that as a given fact and based all physics only on that. Until recently, physicists felt it unnecessary to question what space and time are. And they just posit it as a self-explanatory fact. They considered it as something which in mathematics can be described with a coordinate system that eventually can be curved by a mass, something which is usually depicted with these kind of pictures of non-Euclidean surfaces of coordinate patches. However, in more recent times, um, there is a growing awareness that our underlying assumption with respect to notions such as space and time must be somehow reconsidered. It is a curious historical fact that already in the 1960s a fundamental mathematical discovery made again by John Archibald Wheeler and Bryce DeWitt, uh, which made physicists puzzle. We know that the time-dependent Schrödinger equation is the base for the description of the entire quantum world. When applied to atoms, molecules or larger aggregates of particles, it successfully describes matter. However, when Wheeler and David tried to apply the same rule, uh, rules of general relativity to quantum mechanics by rewriting the Schrödinger equation, not for a particular isolated quantum system, but for the entire universe, something strange happened to their calculations. We know that the Schrödinger equation has a temporal dependence, that T, or derivation over T, that we see, see here in the formula. And that is, it is just the differential equation that allows us to calculate, calculate the dynamical evolution of a system in time. If, however, one applies 
the same rules of general relativity to quantum mechanics to the whole universe, it can be shown that the very same equation loses its temporal component. That is, the universe as a whole suddenly appears as timeless. This seemed at first to make no sense. We know all very well through our direct everyday, everyday experience that in our universe things change in time. The quantum system we call the universe does not at all look timeless. It, it appears to us as being subject to time and change in time, something that changes continuously. For this reason, Despite the fact that nobody was able to disprove the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, it was, if not ignored, but at any rate set aside for a long time, since nobody knew how to make any sense of it, out of it. Nowadays, physicists still do not know what the deep and fundamental message is that nature is trying to convey us here. But after the failure of pre previous theories of quantum gravity, the question about the nature of space and time gained new impetus. The Wheeler-DeWitt equation seems to suggest that the dynamically mm, in time-changing universe we perceive with our mental consciousness uh, seems to be ultimately something that deep down has a property of static immobility, contradicting any mental conception and sense-mind experience. The lack of progress to build a theory of quantum gravity has led physicists to question if space and time might not be themselves emergent properties, such as colors, tastes or the wetness of water, and other qualities of the macroscopical world we perceive with our senses and which are emergent properties of physical phenomena at a microscopic scale. But nobody knows for sure where or what to look for and in what direction physics should proceed. Because physics is itself an intellectual construct that stands up in the pillars of the notions of space and time. If we take away, away these fundamental concepts, then one must uh, wonder what physics is about at all. It is here where the vaster and more comprehensive vision of the universal process described by Sri Aurobindo can become of interest and reconcile the apparent opposites. From the supramental consciousness one does no longer see or conceive physical reality as an unfoldment of time successions, but as the action of a timeless and changeless eternal being. From supermind everything is a pure future, featureless and causeless eternal absolute. A changeless and are temporal infinite that does not create but manifests itself in itself through self-determinations in time and space. But above that very same time and space itself. An eternity in motion status, as Rubino used to say. From this perspective space and time do not appear neither as separate entities, nor as separable aspects of the infinite, but as self-extensions. Space as an objective self-extension of the Brahman in the Brahman, while time as its subjective self-extension. Again, of the Brahman in the Brahman itself. Objective in the sense that this infinite consciousness steps back, so to speak, and becomes itself object of experience of itself. Subjective in the sense of a qualitative experience of a supracosmic consciousness of itself, in itself. Just as Wheeler imagined the it observing the bit, which is 
observing itself as the evolving universe in space and time. After all, it couldn't be otherwise, since there is nothing else beyond that consciousness, which is the one without a second, and at the same time is extreme variety in multiplicity. Well, this was my summary. Now let me read it directly from the words of Sri Aurobindo. The original status is that of the reality timeless and spaceless. Space and time would be the same reality, self-extended, to contain the development of what was within it. The difference would be as in all the other oppositions, the spirit looking at itself in essence and principle of being, and the same spirit looking at itself in the dynamism of its essence and principle. Space and time are our names for this self-extension of the one reality. We are apt to see space as a static extension in which all things stands or stand or move together in a fixed order. We see time as a mobile extension which is measured by movements and events. Space then would be Brahman in self-extended status. Time would be Brahman in self-extended movement. But this may be only a first view and inaccurate. Space may be really a constant mobile the constancy or, and the persistent time relation of things in it creating the sense of stability of space. The mobility creating the sense of time movement in stable space. Or again, space would be Brahman extended for the, whole, the holding together of forms and objects. Time would be Brahman self-extended for the development of the movement of self-power carrying forms and objects. The two would then be a dual aspect of the one and the same self-extension of the cosmic eternal. In the theory of general relativity, space and time are represented as a unique space-time manifold. Either in general relativity as in quantum mechanics, time is just a parameter and represents the flow of a space-time slice through and along a larger four-dimensional di space-time block. That is the three space, di space dimensions, the three spatial extensions and one temporal dimension, where past, present and future are represented as a unique and eternally present block. This is a uh, phys philosophical perspective called eternalism and it is sometimes referred also as the block time or block universe. In physics, especially in Einstein's relativity, it is quite conventional to consider time as an added dimension to the three spatial extensions. If, however, time can be considered as yet another dimension which nature and essence can be placed on an equal footing with the spatial ones, well, I would say it's, it's not so obvious. I, would prefer, I tend to prefer not to think in these terms. Anyway, this is what general relativity does. While space appears to us as an objective property of the external physical world we perceive, there is something subjective and less material we intuitively experience about time. From the perspective of a higher consciousness, Sri Aurobindo describes these two concepts, conceptual entities as follows. Two things alone exist, movement in space, movement in time, the former objective, the latter subjective. Extension is real, duration is real, space and time are real. Even if we can go behind extension in space and perceive it as a psychological phenomenon, as an 
attempt of the mind to make existence manageable by distributing the indivisible, indivisible whole in a conceptual space, yet we cannot go behind the movement of succession and change in time. For that is the very stuff of our consciousness. We are and the world is a movement that continually progresses and increases by the inclusion of all the successions of the past in a present uh, which represents itself to us as the beginning of all the successions of the future. A beginning, a present that always eludes us because it is not for it has perished before it is born. What is is the eternal indivisible succession of time carrying on its stream a progressive movement of consciousness also indivisible. Duration then, eternally successive movement and change in time, is the soul absolute. Becoming is the only being. In case, in any case, if spirit is the fundamental reality, time and space must either be conceptive con conditions under which the spirit sees its own movement of energy or else they must be fundamental conditions of the spirit itself which assumes a different appearance or status according to the status of consciousness in which they manifest. In other words, there is a different time and space for each status of consciousness and even different movements of time and space within, within each status. But all would be rendering of a fundamental spiritual reality of time-space. In fact, when we go beyond physical space, we become aware of an extension on which all this movement is based and this extension is spiritual and not material. It is self of spirit containing all action of its own energy. This origin or, or basic reality of space begins to, be, to become apparent when we draw back from the physical. For then we become aware of a subjective space extension in which mind itself lives and moves and which is other than physical space-time. And yet there is an interpretation, interpenetration, sorry, interpenetration, for our mind can move in its own space in such a way as to effectuate a movement also in space of matter or act upon something distant in space and matter. In a still deeper condition of consciousness, we are aware of a pure spiritual space. In this awareness, time may no longer seem to exist because all movements, all movement ceases, or if there is a movement or happening, it can take place independent of any observable time sequence. If we go behind time, a similar inward mo motion drawing back from the physical and seeing it without being involved in it, we discover that time observation and time movement are relative, but time itself is real and eternal. It would seem as if time had no objective reality, but depends on whatever conditions may be established by action of consciousness in its relation to status and motion of being. Time would seem to be purely subjective. But in fact, space also would appear by the mutual relation of mind space and matter space to be subjective. In other words, both are the original spiritual extension, but it is rendered by mind in its purity into a subjective mind field and by sense mind into an objective field of sense per perception. Subjectivity and objectivity are only two sides of one consciousness. And the cardinal fact is that any given time or space or any given time space as a whole is a status of being in which there is a movement of the consciousness and force of the being. <clears throat> 
a movement that creates or manifests events and happenings. It is a relation of the consciousness that sees and the force that formulates the happenings, a relation inherent in the status, which determines the sense of time and creates our awareness of time movement, time relation, time measure. In its fundamental truth, the original status of time behind all its variations is nothing else than the eternity of the eternal just as the fundamental truth of space. The original sense of its reality is the, the infinity of the infinite. These statements of Sri Aurobindo bring us back inevitably to the problem that modern theoretical physics has. After so many attempts to find for quantum gravity theory, such as superstrings, canon canonical quantum gravity, that as you know are the most famous ones, but there are many others, it is becoming clear that not only space and time are not absolute, but must be conceived as relative concepts, as relativity told us, but are also meaningless if considered on its own. Because when we try to quantify a physical property of a body, we always have to relate this property by comparison to something else. For instance, it makes no sense to speak about the length of an object if we do not compare its length against a reference length. Uh, take from, for example, um, we need a ruler as a reference against which we measure the length of the other objects. But also this ruler needs a reference definition of length, such as the meter. So we need a definition for a length first before being able to mark the subdivisions in centimeters, centimeters and, centim and millimeters on the ruler itself. But the definition of one meter needs also a re reference physical object that can be used as an international standard. This physical object was once a platinum ir iridium bar that was used as a universal reference for the length of one meter and against which the length of all other objects, objects could be compared and measured. Unfortunately, it turned out that with time such a material bar is affected by many outer physical disturbances and does not maintain perfectly its length. So scientists uh, had later to decide to use the speed of light as a measure for standard length. Because, um, well, more precisely, nowadays the length of one meter is defined as the length that the light travels in vacuum during a time interval of one part over about um, 300 millions of a second. This is the best definition for length because we know from relativity that the speed of light in vacuum is always the same. But notice that this again requires yet another reference. Namely, we need to agree on a universal time unit, such as the second, against which we can measure the space, the space that light travels in that def definition of a second. And how do we define a second? We need, again, a physical phenomenon which repeats itself regularly in time, such as the number of atomic transitions of an atom, as modern atomic clocks do, for example. But how do we know that these atomic transitions repeat itself regu regularly? Well, we reach now almost a bottom because we believe that the same physical phenomenon with the same physical boundary conditions will take the same time to manifest. But if you think about this, this is at bottom an assumption we set a, pri a priori, not something we can claim to be true in an absolute sense because we measured it. The time interval of an atomic transition, in fact, depends from the value of the fundamental physical constants. Say, for example, in another universe where there are different physical constants, time would flow very differently than in our universe. But nevertheless, nobody would notice the difference. 
because finally everything is compared to its fundamental constants and elementary events in one's own universe. So one gets into an infinite logical loop which struggles to find the ultimate reference against which to compare a physical magnitude. We finally end up by finding that every measurement we make in physics has only a meaning if we create a relational dependence between the object measured and a background measure or a background process. It is interesting to note that among the many interpretations of quantum mechanics, there is also the so-called relational quantum mechanics, and which emphasized perhaps best this aspect. In this theory, there is, or interpretation, there is no meaning in saying that a certain quantum variable has taken a specific value. Rather, there is meaning only in saying that the variable has taken that value with respect to another reference system. In the words of Carlo, Carlo Rovelli, who is the founder of this theory, Quantum mechanics is a theory about the physical description of physical systems relative to, each, relative to other systems. And this is a complete description of the world. Well, if it is a complete description of the world, I'm not so sure, but certainly I believe he is on something here because that's after all somehow directly or indirectly Sri Aurobindo is telling us as well. This understanding of quantum mechanics emerged from the realization that the timelessness of the wheeler de Witt equations equation emerges because there is no time to relate in the first place. Once you look at the universe outside of it, that is also outside of time, one loses the temporal relation and reference, and the universe appears as timeless. Looking at this from a more spiritual, mystic uh, perspective, one might say that there is always a pure, unconditioned, timeless infinite that may condition itself in a temporal context. But this happens only as a mental division, which makes part as an inherent aspect of the featureless, eternal and the beyond time Brahman. As Shorobindo says, our divisions and successions are only figures in a mental experience. It is mind which creates forms by an impinging of force upon force so as to create a beginning of fixed relations. So I continue reading directly from him, we make the distinction of conditioned and unconditioned and we imagine that the unconditioned became conditioned. The infinite became finite at some date in time and may choose to be finite at some other date in time. Because it is so appear, it so appears to us in details, particulars, or with regard to this or that system of things. But if we look at existence as a whole, we see that, the, that infinite and finite coexist and exist in and by each other. Even if our universe were to disappear and reappear rhythmically in time, as was the old belief, that too would be only a large detail and would not show that at a particular time, all condition cheeses in the whole range of infinite existence and all being becomes the unconditioned. At another, it again takes on the rea reality or the appearance of conditions. The first source and the primary relations lie beyond our mental divisions of time. In the divine timelessness or else in the indivisible or eternal time of which our divisions and successions are only figures 
in a mental experience. As to this latter aspect, the timelessness of an indivisible eternal, another nice interpretation of quantum mechanics is can be interesting in this regard, and it is a so-called time symmetric or also two-vector interpretation. An interpretation which is based on the idea that the laws of quantum physics apply equally well if we consider not only the initial conditions of a quantum system, but also its state in the future altogether. That is, instead of considering a single wave function that describes the quantum system's evolution from an initial to a final state in time, that is, from the present to a future state, it uses also a second wave function which evolves the system from the future to the present. This addition of a time symmetry and a second wave function or a second state vector, therefore the name time symmetric and two vector, two vector interpretation, might look like an unnecessary complication in the theory. However, it is interesting how it is able to catch perfectly the, the whole standard quantum mechanics uh, theory and sometimes makes the calculations even simpler. On one side, our everyday mind, sense mind based experience tells us that there is only the, the present, while the past is gone and the future has still to come. But all the physical laws we know do not forbid the time parameter to go back, like in a film playback. The time symmetric interpretation of quantum mechanics says even more than that. It tells us that we can regard the now as something which has been evolved from the future to the present. This might appear only as a wordplay or a mathematical abstraction without real meaning. But when we look back at Sri Aurobindo's description of what time appears from the supramental state of consciousness, what he called the supramental time vision, or also Trikaladrishti, things uh, seems to fit well into this description. He says that the infinite time consciousness is founded first on its eternal identity beyond the changes of time. Secondly, on a simultaneous eternity of time in which past, present and future exist together, forever, in the self-knowledge and self-power of the eternal. Thirdly, in a total view of the three times as one movement, singly and indivisibly seen even in their succession of stages, periods, periods last, and that only in the instrumental consciousness, in the step-by-step -step evolution of the moments. Two states and powers of existence, that of the timeless infinite and that of the infinite deploying in itself and organizing all things in time. With the knowledge founded on the supramental identity and vision, the two are only coexistent and concurrent status and movement of the same truths of the infinite. The unified infinite time consciousness of the timeless infinite maintains in itself at once in a vision of totalities and of particularities of mobile succession of moments, sight and of total stabilizing vision or abiding whole sight, what appears to us as the past of things, the present and their future. Therefore, an eternal time consciousness is Shirobindo speaking about, that has a total and unified vision of actual actualities. A vision, a supramental time vision, which goes far beyond our mentality and where permanence or representations are thrown up by the eternity of supermind into an indivisible continuity 
of time division, so to speak. So time, as we know it, from our limited mind consciousness, results only as an artificial shadow of a much more profound truth about space, time and all the phenomenal universe. Physics is slowly but steadily discovering that the cosmos as we experience it is an illusion and yet the project projection of a very concrete reality. This is, I think, one of the very fundamental messages about the physical reality we experience and how we can and eventually should relate it to a spiritual and uh, transcendent vision and experience.